that is committed to advancing more productive, sustainable, and competitive agriculture, as well as rural development in our America's hemisphere. This is a challenge, and it's against the backdrop of an agricultural system that has experienced challenges in the past. We continue to experience challenges at present, and you, we know how numerous these are. And we know that we will have challenges continuing in the future. So to keep ahead of the game, as well as to take advantage of opportunities that usually accompany challenges, we have to arm ourselves with the appropriate policies, the appropriate tools, processes, systems, regulations, you name it. In other words, we have to have the relevant knowledge in a multiplicity of areas. ECA prides itself in being an effective knowledge broker. Our delegation in Canada has to support this role by sharing and connecting Canadian technologies, innovations, expertise, systems, standards, regulations, etc., with our member countries on a regular basis. With previous sessions covering applications such as biofertilizers and nanotechnology, it is our pleasure to host today's session, which will provide an introduction to the application of satellite technology in agriculture, as well as provide for us useful resources, which include open source data that we can all tap in on, and networks, relevant networks, that can aid us in planning, monitoring, and in our whole management system for agricultural development of the hemisphere. I'm therefore confident that there will be important takeaway points and ideas for follow-up and networking for everyone online. At this point, I want to bid you good day again and turn over to our moderator, Ms. Lindsay Vibe who is our technical cooperation specialist in the delegation of ECA Canada for the introduction of speakers. Thank you so much, and I trust we will have a very productive session. Thank you very much, Dr. Burnett. I'm very excited to introduce our two very knowledgeable speakers for today. Our first speaker is Dr. Heather McNair. She is a senior research scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada's Science and Technology Branch in Ottawa, Canada. Dr. McNairn has 30 years of research experience in developing methods to monitor soil and crops using multispectral, hyperspectral, and synthetic aperture radar sensors. This experience has included the analysis of multi-frequency, multipolarization, and fully polarimetric SAR data acquired from ground-based scatterometers, airborne SARs, and various satellite platforms. She has led numerous national and international research teams and has authored 85 peer-reviewed scientific papers. Our second speaker is Dr. Alyssa Whitcraft. She is an associate research professor in the Department of Geographical Sciences at the University of Maryland and is the manager of the NASA Food Security and Agriculture Consortium as well as being seconded part-time to the GEO Global Agricultural Monitoring Secretariat as program scientist. In the latter role, she leads the data coordination activities for GEOGLAM, serves as point of contact for space agencies through CEOS, and coordinates the agricultural monitoring in the Americas Working Group. She has a broad portfolio ranging from international coordination to applications research in the fields of remote sensing of agriculture the intersection of Earth observation with global policy framework, stakeholder engagement, and capacity development assessment, and geographic education and pedagogical tools research. Dr. McNairn will 
speak first about her research and its applications, and Dr. Whitcraft will follow her, speaking about international efforts to coordinate use of remote sensing and potential opportunities for collaboration in the Americas. Following their presentations, there will be plenty of time for questions, as well as discussions on how participants can get involved in this work. With that, I will pass the mic over to Dr. McCann to start her presentation. Uh, buenos dias, Todos. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here uh, with you today um, to show you um, a little bit of background on remote sensing and as well how uh, within Canada we're using some of these tools to um, map and monitor our agricultural landscape. So here is the outline of the webinar uh, this morning. I want to talk very briefly on some background related to remote sensing, and I apologize to those of you who have that technical background, but just to sort of set the table in terms of um, some of the um, technical aspects of both optical sensors as well as uh, radar or microwave sensors. Then after a few slides of introduction, I want to show you uh, just a few examples of how this satellite technology can be used to monitor both crops and, and soils. Uh, at the end of the presentation, I won't go through the tables, but I have put together a list of tables of various sensors that will be of interest to some of you for agricultural monitoring, um, and that those will be made available to you to go into greater detail. And then I'll be passing the presentation off to Alyssa, and she's going to uh, uh, talk about the GeoGlam and Amerigios um, activities. So with that, let's uh, delve into a little bit of background on um, remote sensing. So when we talk about satellite sensors, uh, these sensors differ in many different ways. Uh, first of all, we talk about the wavelengths that are used. So sometimes we're using sensors that are collecting data at, at optical wavelengths. And sometime we're sometimes we're talking about satellites that collect data at longer microwave wavelengths. Uh, these sensors also vary depending on whether they're active sensors. So active sensors send out their own energy, uh, so pulses of energy. You can think about uh, LIDAR is, is one example, or, or active radar is another example. Or some sensors, or many sensors, are in fact passive sensors, and these sensors are simply recording how much energy is emitted from the Earth or is reflected by, by the Earth. The swath, so a swath is really the footprint of the satellite. This is sort of one look, um, how big of an area one, one image covers. Uh, and these swaths vary uh, tremendously, and you'll see that in the slides at the end of the presentation. So we have some satellites that cover only tens of kilometers, and we have other satellites that one, one footprint, one image will cover um, a thousand or more kilometers in, in one, uh, one picture. Uh, there's, there's usually a trade-off, so uh, those smaller swaths, those tens of kilometers of swaths, those sensors tend to have very high spatial resolutions, so these satellites will have resolutions that are less than a meter. Uh, or we can look at some of the sensors that have very large swath coverages, but then the pixels, the individual resolutions are quite large. And the temporal re revisit changes as well. Some satellites are acquiring data once or twice a day, and other satellites will revisit that site on the Earth maybe only every few days or weeks. And basically, we choose the right sensor to fit the application, and we're going to see why we have an advantage of, of using one versus the other. There are a large number of international data providers. Uh, many of those are commercial providers. They tend to provide those very high-resolution satellites. And, uh, but there are a large number of satellites uh, that are the data is made available through international space agencies. And what's important to note is that those space agencies are moving more towards free and open uh, data access. So this is data that you can download from the internet and start working with uh, right away. So this is the, uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. So on the left hand, uh, we see these very uh, long wavelengths, very low frequency energy, 
And then as we move along the spectrum, we get into very high resolution, um, very um, or very high frequency um, and uh, smaller wavelengths. Uh, so these are the what I've highlighted here are really the two regions that we deal with mostly in agriculture monitoring. So this this pink area, this is the area of radar um, microwave energy. So these wavelengths are much longer. So one wavelength would be anywhere from a centimeter to even uh, greater than a meter. And the advantage of those very long wavelengths is that these class of sensors are not affected by cloud. And that means that regardless of whether there's cloud cover or not, these sensors can um, send out pulses of energy and record a response. So that's very important in areas of the country or areas of the, the globe where we have significant uh, cloud cover. Because the wavelengths are very long, they have uh, much deeper penetration too. So that means that when they interact with the soil or the vegetation, they penetrate or they go deeper into that, that target. So they do have some advantages. When we move into those, um, uh, those higher frequency, smaller wavelengths, now we're talking about wavelengths that are not in, in centimeters in length, but these are nanometers. So from 400 nanometers up to 3,000 nanometers, for example. And now these, these sensors we think of as the, in the visible region, blue, green, and red, or in the infrared region. So these are slightly longer uh, wavelengths. And these, and these sensors tend to be passive sensors. And the amount of, of energy that they are recording that are, that's reflected from crops and soils largely depends on the pigmentation in the plant the internal leaf structure or the moisture. So these class of sensors are really uh, sensitive to the chemical and physical properties more at the atomic level, and the microwaves are responsive more at the molecular level. So advantages and disadvantages for both of those. Uh, other characteristics of the sensors, I talked about the spatial resolution at the beginning. So this is the size of the smallest possible feature that that sensor can detect. So in passive sensors, uh, that, that is uh, determined by their instantaneous field of view. And for active sensors, like these class of radars or microwaves, the resolution is determined by the length that the pul of pulse of energy that those sensors send out and the size of that of the antenna as well. So you'll see that different radars have different um, spatial resolutions. We also talk about spectral resolution. So this is not only how many channels or bands that that sensor records, but it's also the width of the band. So we can think about black and white or panchromatic as we call it. Uh, that type of sensor is recording uh, just one channel of information and it's over uh, 300 nanometers. So it's very a very broad band sensor when we're thinking about black and white or panchromatic. When we think about multispectral or especially these hyperspectral sensors, so hyperspectral sensors will record energy at hundreds and hundreds of channels, and the channels are very small, are very narrow. So they will be, for example, recording 200 channels, but perhaps at one nanometer of resolution. And then we talked about the, the temporal resolution. So that's the frequency at which, at which the sensor sees or revisits a particular site on the, uh, on the globe. And that temporal resolution depends on the satellite itself, but it also depends on how those swaths overlap and what latitude. So the higher latitude you are on the Earth, the, uh, the greater the revisit for many of these sensors. Uh, so just a couple more slides before we get into some examples. So I'm going to talk first about, about those optical sensors. Uh, so these sensors, for example, are sensitive to the internal structure um, of, of leaves or of crops. And that internal structure acts as a very good uh, diffuse reflector, especially in near-infrared near wavelengths. So I'm going to show uh, in this slide and the next slide some of these graphs. So these graphs shows shows the amount of light that's reflected in a percent. And then we have the optical wavelengths um, along this axis. So these are the blue, green, and red wavelengths here. And then the near infrared and the, the farther or the short wave infrared. So this is basically a response of a healthy leaf over these different wavelengths. 
And what you see is that in some parts, in blue and in, in red, uh, the chlorophyll in the plant actually absorbs energy. So you get this absorption feature. And healthy leaves have a high reflection in infrared. So you see a, a, a big response in uh, the reflectance in infrared. And then we have some parts of the spectrum where the amount of water in the crop uh, canopy will, uh, will absorb the energy and you get these absorption features. And I'm going to show you some examples of how we're using that to monitor the condition of, of crops and soils. So a common um, approach in remote sensing is to use um, what we call vegetation indices, and these are usually ratios of these different reflection features. So one that you, will, uh, you may be familiar with is called the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. And this index basically measures the difference between the absorption from chlorophyll in the red band and that reflection in near infrared. So the greater the difference between these two reflect, uh, reflectances, uh, the healthier or the healthier the crop, or or perhaps the more biomass that crop has accumulated. So that's sort of a simple way of, of using these reflectance features. So we talked about crops, but you can also look at the reflectance of soils. So this is a, a similar graph. Here we have the reflectance. Um, of energy um, on this axis, and here we have these different wavelengths from visible to uh, far infrared. And I'll just point out, uh, if you look at the top, um, the top feature here, that's uh, feature B, this is a soil that has um, less organic matter in it, so this is more of a mineral soil, and this Line uh, number A here is a soil that has a lot of organic matter in it, so it has a lower reflectance. So these different graphs represent different soil types and uh, different soil features. So in this case, the difference in the amount of organic matter. And at the bottom one, the last one I'm going to show you is this a graph, again, looking at the reflectance versus the wavelengths. And here what we're trying to trying to differentiate is the difference between soil and residue. So residue is that amount of vegetation that's left after the crop is harvested. And what you can see is there's a big difference in the reflectance between residue and soil, and there's a particular feature here in the infrared um, that is commonly used to differentiate between the amount of residue that's on the soil and, and the soil itself. So that's a little background on the optical side of things. So let's take a look at some examples. So I have a few examples here. This, these set of examples come from these hyperspectral sensors. So recall these are sensors that have hundreds of bands that are very narrow, perhaps one nanometer in width. So these are two fields. Uh, this is a bean crop and this is a, a, a soybean crop and we've imaged these using hyperspectral sensors. And some of the methodologies we've been able to look at, what is the percent crop cover? So how much of each pixel in this field is covered by soybean uh, versus how much is covered with soil? And you can see um, these areas here that are green and yellow. This is high soil cover or high crop cover. Um, so that tells us that the emergence of this crop in this field varies across that, that field. And for some reason at this part of the field, there is a greater cover of soybean um, than in, in the rest of the field. We also use those absorption features I talked about to estimate how much chlorophyll is in uh, the leaf of those soybean, uh, soybean uh, crops. And in this other field, the reverse, we're looking at for each pixel in that field, what percentage of that pixel is covered with soil versus a uh, crop. And again, you can see in this field that the, the growth of that soybean crop across the field varies a, a great deal. So these blue areas have much lower uh, amounts of vegetation or, or crop than uh, sort of the red and, and green. Here's an example of that vegetation index, uh, the NDVI. And in this case, areas of red show uh, much higher biomass um, than the areas of, of green and yellow. And finally, an example where we can use those absorption features for water, and we can uh, provide an estimate of how much water uh, is in that uh, soybean canopy. So that's an example of some of the hyperspectral um, um, outputs. 
Here's an example. This is using these multi-spectral sensors. So recall these sensors have fewer bands, maybe uh, four, five, six, or seven. Uh, and the bands are, are much wider than with the hyperspectral sensors. But even with these sensors, we can provide interesting information about uh, crop productivity. So in this example, we're looking at the productivity of corn and soybean crops. And here we're providing estimates of the leaf area index of those crops, as well as how much biomass uh, is, is in each of these fields. Uh, on the left, you have a year in 2012 where um, it was a very dry year for this part of, of Canada. And on the right-hand side, we have a much, uh, much wetter year. The top shows you estimates of leaf area index. So this is the amount of leaf cover um, uh, meter squared by meter squared. We have the biomass of leaves of corn and soybean and the total biomass of the corn and soybean crops. And so you can quickly see from these sensors that we see a big difference, um, especially in the biomass between this dry year and these darker green uh, fields that show uh, greater levels of, of biomass. So another example of using that satellite technology to monitor productivity. This is an example from soils. Uh, so in this particular example, again, we're using these multispectral sensors. And here we're trying to determine how much residue is left on fields after the farmers harvest the fields and after they till the fields. Um, so we took a, a satellite image over an area in Canada and we processed this image to tell us for each pixel what percentage of that pixel is covered with residue and what percentage of that pixel is covered with soil. And we've just bin these into these categories so any field that has um, a blue color represents uh, mostly soil. So there's very little residue left on those fields. And fields that are yellow, orange, and red have very high residue levels. What's interesting is this particular field. So here we have a field where we have some areas that have uh, almost no residue on them, uh, so close to 0% residue, and then these strips a very high residue. And what was happening at the time that this satellite was taking this picture is that this particular producer was tilling his field. And you see the blue areas where he's already tilled and then these strips in the, in the uh, field where the residue looks like this, so very high corn residue. So what we can do with this, for example, is we can monitor tillage uh, using these sensors. So this is an example at a watershed scale where we took two images, uh, one in October and one in November. We applied this methodology and then we tracked each field to see how the residue was changing. So fields where the residue uh, was reduced uh, in that approximate one month period tells us that those farmers have been tilling those, those fields. So a, a soil example. Uh, now I wanna move on and talk a little bit about um, uh, about radars. Uh, so as I said, these sensors are recording uh, information at much longer wavelengths. So again, they're not affected by cloud cover. Um, and so that's very important in regions of the world where we have a lot of, a lot of cloud cover or for time critical operations like flooding where we need the information um, even when the clouds are present. And again, they have a deeper pen penetration into the um, into the soil or into the crop canopy. So what are these radars sensitive to? We talked a little bit about this before, um, but they're sensitive to the amount of water, either in soils or vegetation. They're sensitive to how rough the soil is. Uh, so when you till the soil and you create a, a lot of roughness, as in this field, which has been moldboard plowed, we see higher roughness and the radar sees that as a brighter target or if we have some sort of structure in the field. So this is a planting structure, uh, or it could be a tillage rows as well. So the radar will, will see these types of features differently. And then the canopy itself, again, these pulses of energy from the radar penetrate through the canopy, scatter within the canopy, and, and provide a response back to the satellite. And depending on sort of the, the height 
the density, the structure of these crops, the amount of energy will will be different. And we use those differences to uh, to develop methodologies with these satellites. I guess the animation's not working on this one. No, it's okay. Okay, so uh, I'll talk. A, I'll provide a few examples of how we're using uh, these microwave. We call them synthetic aperture radar or SAR sensors. This first example is uh, for monitoring soil moisture. Uh, so here we collected some radar imagery over a field in, in Chile. So this is a field where chicory is being uh, grown, and these top pictures show the differences in the soil textures in that field. And what you see is in this part of the field, this half of this chicory field, these have uh, these soils have high higher sand content, so this is it's a dry part of the field. And this is an irrigated um, this is an irrigated field. So what we did is we collected radar images uh, uh, in October of 20, uh, 2016 over about a 10 day period. So what you see in these images is anything that is red uh, is very dry, and anything that is blue has uh, is wetter. It has more soil moisture. Uh, so what we see is in October this field is pretty dry. Then the producer in this three-day period has irrigated this part of the field, and we see an increase in the soil moisture. Um, and then about a week later, we see that that part of the field has started to dry, and you can see that it's not drying the same across the entire field. So this part of the field is, is wetter than uh, the north part of the field, and that's driven by those differences in texture. But what we're able to do is monitor the irrigation and then what the soil moisture, uh, how the soil moisture responds to drying after irrigation. Uh, here's an example of looking at tillage. So again, this is sort of looking at a change over time. So this is one image that was acquired uh, on October the 10th, and one week later we collected a, another radar image. And then we look at how the backscatter, how the radar re difference, uh, how the response from the radar differed in this one week period. And this bottom image here, anything in white, uh, the the response that the radar collected in that seven day period has changed. So either the response has increased in one week or it has decreased. So what's circled in, in um, blue here, these are fields that have been tilled in that seven day period. And we know that because the backscatter, the response in the radar has increased. So we can see increases in radar response because the fields have been tilled. Or we see some fields uh, circled in red here where the, the radar, the response from the radar has decreased. And it's decreased uh, because these fields have been harvested. So again, we can just use a simple change difference between two images to tell whether fields have been tilled or whether they've been harvested. Uh, a couple of other examples. Uh, the next two examples are looking at rice. So this is a uh, study that we did in the Philippines. And what we wanted to do is use radar imagery to do three things. Um, identify the acreages of rice that are growing in this part of the Philippines. To identify when the rice has been planted. And to estimate what the rice yields are. So we developed a methodology, again, using these radar microwaves to um, identify acreage timing of planting, and then we used a neural network uh, to be able to estimate what the uh, yields of these rice fields are and comparing those to um, government statistics. So the, the accuracy between the estimated yield and the government reported yield for this region, the accuracy was 94%. And a second example, this one is from China, uh, again using a radar satellite, one of these synthetic aperture radar sensors. Uh, so in this part of China, there's about 15,000 hectares of rice that's under cultivation. And the Ministry of Agriculture in China wanted to understand how the rice acreage was changing in this part of, of China. 
So we collected radar images over two years, 2008 and 2009. And through a sort of a simple classification process, we were able to identify how much acreages, how much acreage of rice was, was changing. So those fields in red, these are, um, this is rice that was planted in 2008, but there was a change and it was not planted in rice the following year. And the reverse was true for these green fields where the rice was planted in the second year, but not in the first year. And what we were able to determine is that about 10% of this land experience change uh, from rice to non-rice or uh, in the reverse. And this was largely driven, driven by market demand as prices for some of the other cash crops in this region were higher and that um, encouraged farmers to drain their rice paddies and, and plant some of these other uh, cash crops. I want to take you through a couple of examples of how within Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada we are using some of this technology more on an operational basis. So the first case study I want to show is, is how we're developing an annual crop inventory for Canada and how this is being um, delivered operationally. Uh, I won't go through this slide in any detail, um, but there is data collection both with those radar sensors I talked about as well as optical sensors. So we combine both of those classes of sensors together. We collect some ground information. Uh, we do some processing, uh, pre-processing on the satellite data to get it ready for the classifier. And then we have this supervised classification methodology that takes the ground data and the optical as well as radar satellite data and produces uh, classifications. Um, and then the MAC products are produced and we do a little bit of uh, post-processing of the products. There is an assessment of the accuracy um, and there's metadata that's produced that details the methodology and, and the accuracy. So I want to show some examples of that product. Um, so we've been delivering this product operationally uh, for almost 10 years now. Uh, and what this methodology does using this satellite technology is it identifies what crop is growing in every field across the country. So again, this is produced operationally every year. Um, this is an example from 2017. Uh, of the crop classification across Canada. And uh, we're only, um, you know, the, uh, it's only the agricultural extent of Canada that's mapped. So you see in northern Canada, we don't have any, any products. So this is just covering classifications over the agricultural extent of Canada. So this is sort of the national coverage that's provided every year. And if you look at detail, this is the type of detail that, you're, that, that you'll see. So every field is identified for its crop type. And the resolution that this product is delivered at is about 30 meters. Uh, the data is all available. It's free and open to the public. So anyone can go into our open data portal and download these, these maps for Canada. Uh, we had an animation here. I don't think the animation is working, but um, I'll just explain what this shows. Uh, this is a region in Western Canada in our province of Manitoba. And what we've noticed over the last 10 years is that the amount of soybeans that have been grown over uh, this region of the country has increased significantly. So 10 years ago, when we started the crop inventory, there were uh, almost no fields of soybean that were growing. Um, and now we have in this region of the country about 40% of the acreage is, um, is uh, planted in soybeans. And so what we've done um, is we've looked at how the acreages of soybeans have changed um, from 2009 to 2015 um, over this part of the country. So once you've established an operational system, this is the type of tracking of changing cropping patterns that you can uh, produce uh, from some of these um, remote sensing products. A little bit on the soil moisture uh, side of things. So this is not quite operational, but we are almost ready to produce operational products. Uh, so again, our soil moisture methodology, we're taking these radar sensors um, that I talked about, these synthetic aperture radars. We have a tool that is 
freely available in a um, open source uh, um, software from a company called Array. Um, so what this method does is it just pulls in the radar imagery as well as maps of the soil texture. You can bring it into this freeware, this open source freeware, and you can produce uh, maps of surface soil moisture. So this is an output from the soil moisture. And this graph also demonstrates that um, we do validation on all of the products um, in terms of the um, estimated soil moisture from the radar satellite as well as the measured soil moisture from uh, ground measurements. So it's a fairly simple process now to use these radar satellites to estimate soil moisture. And uh, an example of how we've, uh, we've been thinking about using these soil moisture maps. Uh, we did a study looking at um, soil moisture estimated from satellites and how th those estimates can improve flood, um, flood prediction. So in this part, in this watershed in Western Canada, typically what the province does is they measure soil moisture in the field uh, when, um, just before freeze up in the, in the, the fall. Um, and they use th those surface uh, measurements of soil moisture in the fall to provide uh, um, input into flood forecasting for the spring. So the idea here is that at snowfall, if the soil is, is saturated, then that sets us up for a situation where we could be in a flood risk, um, a flood risk e example. So what we were able to demonstrate is that rather than sending people into the field to make measurements once um, just before uh, freeze, if we use soil moisture products from these radar sensors, we can actually improve the, the estimates of the stream flow. So that's a good example of using those uh, soil moisture products. And I mentioned this before in terms of irrigation. So you saw an example from Chile. Uh, this is an, another example of the maps that we produce for soil moisture. This is in Western Canada. And all of these blue um, fields have higher soil moisture. And uh, these round fields are areas of pivot irrigation. So you can see that the radar sensor is able to detect where irrigation is occurring and estimate how much um, moisture is in the soil. And I want to show you um, a couple of other examples um, in terms of how we might be able to use some of these products in um, decision making. So I have a colleague who's working on um, a project where fields that are being drained, um, he's putting control structures on these fields so that um, when the fields are very wet, we can open up the structures and we can let the water run freely out of the fields. But in times of drought, for example, you can close those drainage features to hold the water back on the field. So this is a very interesting um, uh, management practice, but the question from the producers, of course, is how does this affect the productivity? If I put these control structures on my field, is that going to affect the yields that I get? Um, so what we did is we used those methods that I talked about before, and we went back 10 years into the archives of satellite data to look at how much um, biomass is, uh, was recorded or measured um, on um, these fields that have been controlled uh, through these, these structures. And what we were able to demonstrate over 10 years is that the productivity of the fields in which these uh, control, control structures were placed that those fields were, were on average had a higher productivity. So not only was this um, sort of a good environmental management practice, but it also helped improve um, the productivity of the, of the corn fields in, in this particular region. So an example of how you can apply uh, a historical uh, data set to, to sort of monitor the impact. And a next example, uh, this is one that we are currently working on, and we're developing a, a disease risk tool um, using an integration of some of these geospatial products. So the disease that we're starting with is a disease called sclerotinia. So this is a disease that infects canola crops um, in Canada, although it can affect other crops as well. So you can see, for example, in 2010, we had 
um, about $600 million Canadian in lost revenue due to this, um, this pathogen in, in the field. So sclerotinia likes very wet conditions and it needs those wet conditions, wet soil conditions in order to, um, to survive. So what we've done is we've built this decision tool. Uh, we call it the disease risk tool or DIRT. And this disease tool is integrating some of these geospatial products. So we have surface soil moisture, um, and not just what the surface soil moisture is right now, but how many days the soil has stayed wet. So if the soil stays wet for um, up to two weeks, then we have higher risk of this pathogen surviving in, in the soil. We take those, that annual crop um, survey that I, I talked about and we look at the history of, of um, cropping in this region. So in this case, we're looking at when was the last time canola was planted in, in any particular field. Um, so the, if, you've, if you've planted canola in that field more recently, that increases your risk. So if you have very wet conditions over extended periods of time and you've grown uh, canola very recently in that field, and if the temperature and precipitation are just right, now we have a condition where um, at any particular field we have a high risk of this pathogen. So these products are being integrated and, and the products are being uh, produced at 100 meters. And then we're also using radar technology on the right here, and this is identifying what the growth stage of canola is. So we're integrating uh, radar data to be able to identify whether or not these canola uh, fields are flowering. So we have very wet conditions um, ripe for, the, for this disease to, um, to occur and we have flowering cano in canola. Now we know that um, there's probably a need for some sort of intervention um, to reduce the risk of that, that pathogen. So again, a, kind of an example of how we can integrate all of these different products together. Uh, so I'm not going to go through this. These are my last slides before I hand it off to Alyssa. Uh, I won't go through these in any detail, but uh, you can look at them later. Um, so I've selected some of the optical uh, sensors that you may be interested in. Um, so the sensor type is across the, the top of this chart. Um, and then I've listed uh, the country of origin of this sensor, when the sensor was launched, what those spectral bands are uh, for these sensors, the resolution, how big of a swath, remember that's the sort of the image extent, and how often these sensors um, will revisit any particular um, place on the Earth. Not all of these sensors are available uh, publicly. Some of them are commercial, um, but for those that are pu available publicly, I've put the website where you can uh, go and access the data. So I have three charts for um, optical sensors. So those are those three. And the final chart here is showing some of those radar sensors. Um, and again, uh, some of these are commercial sensors, but others are free and open access. So I think with that, I, I'll hand it off to Alyssa so that she can talk to you about GeoGlam and, and Amerigeoff. Thank you, Heather. Um, I see that you're passing presenter role to me now. Can can you guys hear me well? Okay, still? Yes, we can hear you, Alyssa. Okay, great. Um, as a as a question, just a logistics question. I noticed along the top there's a tab with um, the presentation. In it. Do I just leave that open and then go over and share my screen as as we did during the trial? Um, yep. Yeah, you can you can also. Oh. I just did it as soon as you said oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you go back to the um, to the webinar screen, you uh -huh. can actually just um, yeah. actually that's fine. You can also just um, go to the top and you see there's a number there zero one, and then there's a right. small arrow next to it. You can just click on that to go from slide to slide. Ah, so can if if, if I've just advanced to the second slide, can everybody see that now? I've never yeah. Done. That's new for me. Okay, great. I'm going to do that. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> great. You learn something new every day. Okay. Uh, thanks again. Um, earlier I was introduced, um, but to remind you, I'm Alyssa Whitcraft. I'm at the University of Maryland, but I'm also at the GeoGlam Secretariat part-time. Um, I'm going to be talking about GeoGlam and Marigios. 
And this new uh, working group or Grupo de Trabajo, that's what the GT is for here, um, AMA, Agricultural Monitoring in the Americas. Um, so, you know, the, the, the sad truth is that world hunger, we all know this, it's on the rise. Um, undernourished people is, uh, the number of undernourished people worldwide is continuing to go up year after year. This is um, a little bit out of date. The numbers for 2017 and 2018 are not um, looking any better yet. And as we look further into the future, there's going to continue to be, um, you know, an augmentation of the number of people who are vulnerable to food insecurity. Um, this is under sort of the worst case scenario of emissions, but, um, but essentially um, we can do better with, with lowering our emissions and improving our adaptation strategies, um, but that means that we essentially we need to do that. We've got to have um, an understanding of from whence we came as well as an understanding of where we're going. Um, do you know if these, this, um, the way this is shown here is going to allow an animation to work? Because I have a lot of animations. It doesn't seem, I just saw from Heather's it didn't work. So maybe I should just try mine. Pardon me for a moment while I transition over to that. Because there's, there's quite a few. Um, okay, we're on this slide. Is that working for everybody? Yes. Perfect. Okay, great. Thank you for answering. So essentially, the good news is that remote sensing um, provides both global coverage and local details, and it's been doing this since the 1970s. Um, so we can kind of understand from, from where we've come and what the trajectories are. And then with we've got data continuity into the future as um, civilian space agencies and, and governments, are in, and as well as private industry, as Heather was showing in our final slides, have really seen the value of the use of this information for monitoring agriculture and, and making land use uh, decisions. So I want to start out by talking about, about GeoGlam and its um, global policy framework. And also, I'm going to start with a little bit of context um, to from, from whence GeoGlam came. So up until 1972, food prices were pretty stable. Um, and then in 1972, there was what we call the Great Grain Robbery, and it was essentially um, what happened is U.S. sold off a bunch of its grain um, to Russia, not realizing that there was going to be this massive food shortage in other, in other um, major grain-producing areas. And then the U.S. had to buy it back at um, something like 300% of the original price. Um, and so it was at this point that USDA in the U.S. as well as NASA realized that, you know, the only way that they were going to understand and prevent something like this from happening again, these big sort of price hikes and, and uncertainty about what was happening in global food production systems was to utilize satellite data. So that was really the beginning um, of the collaboration between NASA and USDA on using satellite data for monitoring agriculture, and it sort of coincides with the time that one of the earliest Earth observing missions, Landsat 1, was launched. And so since then, remote sensing methods have really expanded, but we've still, we're still seeing price hikes, of course, in 2008 and 2011, with really large impacts um, on food security and human livelihoods worldwide. And so in this context, we already had, um, since 2005, what we call community of practice, a number of, of people from um, universities, organizations around the world getting together um, and kind of working on what the common observation requirements and common research questions were related to using satellite data for agricultural monitoring. So when these food crises hit in 2011, uh, the G20 sent that group, this community of practice, a request saying, you know, we really need, we want you to send us a proposal um, on, on a system that would leverage satellite data to improve information on crop projections and improve early warning. And so what we did was we proposed GeoGlam, what became GeoGlam, which is um, the Group on Earth Observations Global Agricultural Monitoring Activity, GeoGlam. And really our main mandate in the context of, G of the G20 is to improve information on supply. And we have a sister initiative known as AMIS, which is the Agricultural Market Information System, which integrates um, our information along with other 
um, economics and st statistical measures to sort of understand trade flows and um, provide a picture of, of, of food prices worldwide. Hi, Alyssa. Um, very sorry to interrupt. Sure. Um, I just wanted to let you know that, unfortunately, on the Spanish channel, um, the presentation isn't having the animation. Okay. So just when you're when you're um, ex explaining um, some of the things, just kind of be aware that for the people who are listening in Spanish, they're not going to see those animations. Uh, okay, good. Well, all right. Thank you for letting me know that. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, okay, so uh, GeoGlam, I've shown you the policy context. GeoGlam has a lot of activities going on within it. Like I said, it's made up of an open community of people from research organizations, government, non-government, humanitarian sectors, um, you've got private industry as well who are participating, and all with this sort of common goal of improving science-based information for decision, policy, and action in the context of food security, sustainable development, and climate change. And so, the, But the information is really about food production, both um, for market information, food price volatility, and as well as providing early warnings of crop failures, um, early warnings of what might lead to food insecurity for people on, on large scales. So on the, the right side, you'll see there's sort of a simplica simplification of the diagram. You've got input data, satellite data, other in-situ data, and then you go through a variety of geoglam activities, and the outcome is sort of improved decisions, actions, and policies. Um, there's so much packed within that center diagram. The EO data coordination activity, that's the one that, that I, for example, lead within, within GeoGlam. We have operational research and development sites. Um, Heather is leading an experiment right now through, one of, through that site network. Um, we have capacity development in our research to operations efforts. And you know we're working with national, regional, and global monitoring systems to strengthen their use of EO. So you, I'm not going to be able to go into all of that today, but just have in mind that we have a variety of activities going around with actors all over the world. What I am going to highlight is what is probably our most um, visible activity to date. Um, this is a direct outcome of that G20 mandate that I referenced earlier. Um, this is what is known as our GeoGlam Crop Monitor for AMIS, the Agricultural Market Information System. And what this is, they're monthly transparent assessments of crop conditions and outlooks on production that, um, are, uh, that are achieved through a consensus e exercise. We have over 40 partners or close to 40 partners who log into an interface every month, look at their regions of expertise, look at satellite data, look at um, ancillary data sets, and come together to decide on what the conditions are um, of the four major commodity crops, uh, corn, soy, wheat, and rice, uh, worldwide. And then they release this um, on the first Thursday of every month as a part of the AMIS market monitor. And so you can go to cropmonitor.org if you want to take a look at some of the recent reports. Um, the, the, it's a three-page report um, that's got text, maps, and pie charts, and it goes into this larger market monitor report. And also, if there's an extreme weather event or an extreme um, climate sort of, uh, not an extreme climate, but sort of a climate variation going on within a year, we provide um, a tracking of that, in, in particular how it is uh, poised to impact crop production. Um, out of the success of the Crop Monitor for AMIS, which has been uh, operational since 2013, we've launched now what's known as the Crop Monitor for Early Warning. This is a regionalized effort, so you'll see this, this, this shows the Horn of Africa, East Africa, and then we've got Southern Africa. We also have Southeast Asia. We have um, a Central America report as well. We're working on expanding next to an all um, Latin America report and of course we'll be seeking participation um, because as I noted this isn't um, a top-down effort GeoGlam coordinates the production of these reports but all of the information is is delivered through regional expertise 
um, those regional experts sign into this interface and provide their inputs, and um, they have you know access to satellite data and other information to help them come up with their assessment if they haven't done if they they don't already have an idea before they enter the interface. Um, and essentially, this has been a this has been adopted by um, the UN the the UN uh, OCHA, for example, the Office on on uh, the Human Rights. I can't remember exactly what the um, acronym stands for right now. They use this report, for example, to issue to issue a special alert on um, a food security situation. So this is this has had a lot of great uptake. And as I said, next we're working on a crop monitor for Latin America. Um, I wanted to show some examples of EU applications and agricultural decision making that have taken place in the context of GeoGlam. So, for example, in Argentina this year, um, in in February, they they were experiencing um, one of the largest droughts in the last 70 years, with impacts on over 80% of farmlands in Argentina. Um, and the Ministry of Agriculture sent a request to INTA for them to come, physically move into their their offices and um, have them utilize satellite data to essentially help the Ministry of Agriculture come up with a, sorry, that advanced, spatially precise information on, on exactly which areas were impacted. Um, and the result of the use of this, this evapotranspiration from satellite data combined with a crop mask, which you see on the right, was that INCA was able to, with with, with some spatial precision, provide information to the Ministry of Agriculture so they could make a decision about which areas needed to have a declaration of emergency. So that's great. Uh, another example is in East Africa, um, where the crop monitor for early warning was used in Uganda in particular to uh, trigger their disaster risk financing fund. So this is a direct quote from the office of the Prime Minister in Uganda, from the Commissioner. He said, in the past, we always reacted to crop failure, spending billions of shillings to provide food aid in the region. But 2017 was the first time we acted proactively because we had very clear evidence from satellite data early in the season. And so essentially, they were able to utilize this information and mobilize payments to farmers the next day for them to buy new, new seeds, to start a new crop, to do public works and essentially keep them um, with a steady source of income and food uh, so that they wouldn't have an, a food security crisis. This actually ended up saving $2.6 million from Uganda's own um, budget that they usually spend on food aid, and over 150,000 people were helped in the process, and this is in the region of Karamoja in Uganda. Another example is the U European Union has what's known as its common agricultural policy. They have um, sort of rules about cultivations and whatnot. They're able to use a new, a new um, optical satellite sensor called um, Sentinel-2. They're also using a, a radar satellite known as Sentinel-1 to do field level mapping at the national scale of what's being cultivated. So this is an example in the Netherlands. Um, historically, there's been sort of a not the most positive relationship um, between the people who are coming to check up on whether farmers are being compliant, um, and and that can be a sort of a stressful time sometimes for the farmers. And so it eases the farmers' reporting burden, and it also saves millions of euros in the inspectors. They don't have to go and do the field inspections everywhere as we're able to, they're able to do this using satellite data at a very, very fine scale. Um, next, I want to talk about within, so those were some GeoGlam examples, and now I want to talk about um, what we've seen as our approach to improving national capacity to use Earth observations is through a targeted regional approach. So within GeoGlam, we launched our, our regional initiative known as GeoGlam Latino America, which would stretch from essentially Mexico to, to Chile um, and Argentina, and then uh, at the same time, we have a sister initiative known as Amerigios, which covers all of the Americas. And so combined together, we've essentially created a joint effort to enhance capacity to use satellite data for agricultural monitoring in the Americas. Um, the focus is really on facilitating south-south transfer for national capacity development to use EO, the development of regional products like cropland masks, crop type masks, um, you know, that, for example, the 
uh, crop monitor that would cover Latin America. Um, GeoGlam has an R&D focus, which I have not talked about at all today, but we are looking to focus on regional um, research and development priorities for operational agricultural monitoring. We aim to strengthen communication, not just regionally, but within country between the research institutes and the ministries of agriculture and, and uh, livestock and whatnot. And then um, we're also working to contribute to global policy frameworks, not just the G20, but the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the ELAC uh, indicators. And this is essentially what the what that joint effort looks like. It's a new community of practice, agricultural monitoring in the Americas. And it's really, it's toward the objectives of GeoGlam Latinoamerica and Amerigias. Like I said, they're these two sister initiatives and we've joined this single working group together to reach their common goals. And it includes not just the, um, EO data users and analysts, not just the technical audience, but also the users of EO derived information so that these, so that it's sort of a co-community that's developing solutions that for problems that have really already be, been identified. Um, here's an example of something, even though we've only just started an example of some of the progress that we've had already. We've done national scale cropland mapping in Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, and Chile with the direct participation of people from the research institutes and the ministries of agriculture. This was a five-day workshop and on average through the four countries we had initial accuracies of about 80 percent and this is 30 meter cropland mapping um, so really in many cases you're getting down to the field scale which is excellent and and novel in these areas and so we're having a follow-up workshop during the Amerigios week which the whole week is 6 through 10 August um, but the workshop itself is on the 8th of August and it's on um, coming up with crop area estimation to find the area under cultivation so moving beyond mapping and actually to getting an, a precise uh, area estimate of area under cultivation on, on an annual basis so uh, if you're interested in participating, um, I would ask that you contact me or Carlos Dibella, who is the lead of GeoGlam Latino America. He's from INTA in Argentina. Um, and, I, and I'm coordinating all the initiatives. Sorry that that just ended as well. The current partners um, are shown here on the right. And actually, we can add um, INEA Uruguay has recently joined our ranks. And um, NASA is providing support for my time as the coordinator. Um, so if you have any questions, please let me know. That's the conclusion of my presentation. Um, I guess now I can um, pass a presentation back over to um, ICA Canada, I think. Wonderful. Thank you so much to Heather and Alyssa for your very interesting presentation. Um, now we will move into the question and discussion portion of the webinar. We have muted everyone's microphones uh, to minimize disturbance on the line. So to ask a question, uh, please type into the chat box and send to the presenter. Or you can click on the hand next to your name, and this will let us know that you have a question. We will first take three questions from the Spanish channel, and then we will take three from the English channel and go back and forth in that way. Um, Gloria will be reading out the questions from the Spanish chat box, and if you have put up your hand, she will call on you and unmute your line. And Isabel will be managing the English channel in the same way. So thank you very much, and over to you, Gloria. Jorge is asking how he can participate in Geogram from Mexico. Great. Um, can I ask from which um, institution or uh, which affiliation he is? He's a student. Oh, great. At so, the Autonomous University. Thank you. So it is an, uh, an open community, as, um, as I was noting on one, one of the slides that showed a diagram of the community of practice. 
And, and so we would invite the participation of everyone. I would say, um, please email me. I can share with you the terms of reference of our group and sort of what is involved, what it means to participate in terms of your time and level of effort. Um, we're just getting started. We launched really in about, I would say, March of this year. And so um, we're really designing our working areas just now. So it's a great time to get involved. Just please contact me. Next question, Gustavo Bobadilla. Could you share experiences you have had with Colombia? I'm assuming that's a question for me. Um, within within Geoglam Latino America, in the past, we had involvement with um, Corpo Ica. We had a um, between uh, Carlos Dybala in, in Argentina at INTA and Corpo Ica, they were doing palm production monitoring in Colombia. Um, and then now we have the participation of an entire um, Red Colombiana. It's a, it's a Colombian network um, that's just started as well, that's attempting to pull together the various actors in using satellite data for agriculture monitoring. Um, and the representative who's coordinating that is from IDEAM. Um, Cesar Barbuena is his name. Um, and we also, in 2016, we had a training session in Colombia. Heather participated as, a, as an instructor on SAR um, for five days during the Amerigios week. It was the very first one, so um, we learned a lot during that week. And uh, there were, I think, over 50 participants, most of whom were from Colombia in that that GeoGlam um, crop monitor focused training session. But we open, I'm very open to more participation from, from Colombia because um, there are many more institutions besides EDM and Corpo Ica has not become involved in the working group yet. Uh, we offer the floor to Guatemala. Your microphone is open, please. Yes, thank you. Good morning. We have a question here. Perhaps you could give us some guidance on the how we can use uh, this type of monitoring in our uh, agricultural area. We, if we're for risk assessment, basically using this type of tool. Thank you. Um, Heather, do you want to take that question? Yes. Um, could could I just ask for maybe a clarification? What um, our colleagues from Guatemala? What what type of risk are they uh, are they um, speaking about? Guatemala, please, could you repeat your question? Yes. Yeah, I guess if you could give us uh, some idea of some experiences on how to apply this type of monitoring that you have been explaining in the uh, livestock area instead. I, I guess more than agriculture, it is for the livestock area. Could uh, Do you have any experiences in Latin America with that? Um, I, I don't have any experience in, in that particular area related to, to livestock. Um, uh, like uh, Alyssa was demonstrating, you know, a lot of the initial work, um, both in Canada and as well as what GeoGlam is doing, is to sort of provide some of this, this base information, which would be, uh, you know, where is where's the cropland growing uh, or where is it located? What is the annual crop uh, type that's that's growing, and what is the the change in, in the land cover, and as well as some of these productivity measurements, um, as we were showing, looking at the response from some of these optical sensors in terms of you know what you know what's the productivity of the crop. 
So that could be applied to both annual cropland um, as well as rangeland or, or pasture lands as well. So looking at you know where these um, these land covers, pastures, and rangelands are, are growing, and, and sort of what the health of those rangelands um, would be using some of this satellite technology. Um, I don't know, Alyssa, do you have any other thoughts on that? I think what you said is good. Um, I there's a lot of what's not under there's a lot unknown right now um, about what's being cultivated where and what the interannual changes are um, because it wasn't the very distant past that we didn't have a lot of satellite data. We were it was a finite resource only five ten years ago, and the last two to three years has shown an explosion in the number of free and open data sets. Um, that would be useful in Guatemala, an area that has a lot of cloud cover and small fields. The new SAR mission from from um, Sentinel-1 that's freely and openly available and the RadarSat Constellation mission coming up from Canada um, provide really, really excellent inroads to starting to understand um, what's, what's happening both um, on an interannual basis and also looking for changes that would impact food security and agriculture within a single year. Okay, we offer the floor to the English channel now. Okay, um, hello. We have a question from Kelly Witowski from ICA US. Uh, please speak about advances and use of this technology in Latin America. Latin America, how widespread it is and um, in, in which countries? Is Central America using it at all? Hi, Kelly. This is a really good question. So I showed an example in Argentina where it's being used. Um, I know in Chile, uh, Heather also showed some slides. Um, they don't do national scale um, really precise monitoring at this point. They have general vegetation condition that they do, um, but they're working on sort of increasing the communication between the groups that do remote sensing and those who are making decisions. So that's an important pathway that needs to be expanded that, that we're working with. Brazil actually operationally uses um, MODIS data from, from NASA, the NDVI, Heather showed this in her presentation, that sort of gives a, an indication of vegetation condition. Um, they use that operationally to monitor crop conditions nationwide, and they d produce a monthly report us utilizing those satellite data. Um, Mexico also is, is pretty advanced in their usage of satellite data between CIAP and INEGI. Um, I'm truthfully less aware of the, the levels of adoption of satellite data um, in Central America and in some of the um, uh, less less heavily agricultural countries, ones that have a lot are large area of Amazon, for example. Um, but that's part of what we're trying to target through this new working group is, you know, the, one of the very first things that we're undertaking is a needs assessment, which is an evaluation of the current state of use and then also of information needs and, and how they're meeting those information needs currently, what's not being met, and where might we use remote sensing to help facilitate the fulfillment of some of those information needs. Um, and so that's really where we're, we're at the starting point, but there are some very strong examples of national usage and informal reporting um, using satellite observations already. Um, Alyssa, if I, if I can just add to that, uh, your, your response. Um, I, I've had just a, a little bit of interaction with some groups in Costa Rica, um, and, and their interest there is, uh, for example, looking at um, uh, being able to monitor their, their banana plantations, uh, both the acreage as well as the health of those uh, plantations, um, and, and even things looking at, for example, diseases in, in pineapples, so they were quite interested in whether we could use our methods looking at residue 
to be able to track how much uh, pineapple residue is left on the field because for the same reason it can produce conditions of, of disease. Um, but I guess this is part of the reason we're having this webinar is um, to sort of introduce some of the possibilities for, um, for the application of this technology. And it's important, I think, for Alyssa and I, uh, as she was just saying, to understand uh, what the uh, local um, uh, or the country-based um, uh, needs are so that we can help answer those questions whether this technology is going to be able to help or not. Um, so that was just a little bit of my experience in that one particular country. Okay, great, thank you. We have another uh, question from Martin. Okay. So uh, Martin is asking a little bit about uh, some of the geodata services that are being used. Um, so kind of what technologies or methods are being used, whether we're using online computing like cloud processing um, and what type of software. Uh, so to talk about a little bit about the, the services we're using, um, as you can see from what Alyssa presented and what I presented, some of the methodologies are on classification. So we're using uh, mostly um, supervised classification methods to do things like identifying cropland or identifying uh, the crops that are being grown. Uh, but we're also using these vegetation indices that you are referring to. Um, so some of the biomass and the leaf area index uh, methodologies are based on these vegetation indices. So we develop models between the vegetation indice and um, LAI and biomass. Um, so those are pretty well established methodologies. Um, and I think on the classification side of things, um, as well as on sort of the the LAI biomass retrieval. The methodologies are fairly well documented and have been validated um, pretty well. Um, that doesn't mean that there's not some adaptation of the methods that need to be occur if, if we're applying those to, you know, to new crops, for example. So as Alyssa was saying, I'm leading a um, uh, initiative under GEO. It's called uh, JCAM. Uh, it's a joint experiment. And we have sites around the world. We have about 25 sites right now where we are collecting optical and radar data over those sites to try to adapt um, our Canadian methods for crop classification as well as LAI and biomass to those local um, cropping systems. So we do have some sites um, in Latin America. Uh, we have uh, sites in, in um, Chile as well as in, in Argentina and Brazil. And again, trying to adapt these methodologies that we've already developed. So we're, we're a fair ways down the road on the method development, and we're really in the adaptation end of things. The question on the computing, um, right now, um, it, it's sort of a mixture. We do a lot of our, our satellite processing locally on local machines, but we are definitely looking at cloud-based services. Because of the amount of satellite data that's becoming available, we have satellites from Europe, um, satellites from, from the US, um, as well as uh, from, from Argentina, where there will be extensive amounts of time series of data that are being produced. So we're going to see data uh, coming to us um, you know, every, every couple of days, and that's going to require a different approach to processing than um, on sort of a local uh, local machine. So we are looking at that cloud processing, pre-processing stacks of data, and even building applications um, on cloud processing. And we're also trying to move a little bit away from the proprietary software uh, that we've sort of traditionally used. I talked about the array uh, software in one of my slides, so that's an open source software as well. So. Um, so we're trying to move more towards those those open uh, open sources. So I hope that answered your question. Great, thank you very much, Heather. Uh, we have another question from the English Channel, um, asking what technologies are you using to process images in the cloud, and what technologies are you using to collect data in the field in general? Is there a global repository of field data to perform validation? Yeah, so as I was just saying, we're, we're not um, 
at the pro we're not at the point right now where we're doing any processing um, on the cloud, but we are evaluating um, so uh, Google Earth Engine as you are describing here and others as well. So we're really in the early stages of assessing what that service on the cloud might look like. Um, in terms of the data that's being collected in the field, um, in Canada we have a fair bit of documentation in terms of um, how the data, whether it's identifying the crop type or measuring biomass or LAI, we have sort of a protocol um, that we have drafted and, and implemented for ourselves and that we've been sharing with this international community. So that kind of data collection is freely available. And we're encouraging our international partners that are um, working with us under this JCAM experiment to adapt these um, protocols in the field. So we have protocols for soil moisture measurement, collecting biomass, LAI measurements, and identifying crop, um, crop type. Um, in terms of your last question, is there a global repository of field data to perform validation? Um, for soil moisture, there is. Uh, so there are uh, some international networks of soil moisture uh, stations if you're, if you're looking at soil moisture retrieval with radar. So NASA, for example, when they recently launched one of their satellites called SMAP, um, they developed a network of international collaborators around the world to validate the soil moisture that's being delivered from that satellite. So that's the best example of um, accessible and discoverable uh, field data. Um, other data is a little bit more difficult uh, to get access to. Um, within this JCAM initiative that I talked about, the idea of the JCAM um, uh, international team is that the satellite data as well as the ground data from these 25 sites around the world, uh, that field data and satellite data will be shared within that community so that we can validate um, the crop classification, LAI, and biomass retrieval because obviously that's a very important that we understand how well these methods are working. But that data right now is um, available just within that, that JCAM community. Can I um, piggyback onto your response, Heather, and, and also add for both of these, um, within GeoGlam we have an initiative on cloud, co cloud computing. And um, we have a, a working groups that are just being established now. So if there's a, a, um, a large interest in participating in that, I would please ask you again to participate or to contact me and I can put you in touch with the people who are leading those activities. Um, and it, it's, it, we aren't attempting on the GeoGlam side to be a um, sort of a, uh, have a unified uh, cloud system that we're going to develop, but we're, what we're trying to do is serve a curation role. Um, and, and so we're, we'll be evaluating kind of the cloud services that are out there that are actually being developed specifically for food security and agriculture. Like ESA has a thematic exploitation platform that they're developing that's supposed to take advantage of the Copernicus missions and provide some sort of easy solutions for, um, uh, for evaluating your crop conditions in your country. And then um, also, we, I have a project in NASA, for example, that's a a investigating the use of Amazon Web Services um, for monitoring, for, for basically facilitating access to monitoring data. So we have all of these activities going on that are underneath the GeoGlam umbrella, and what GeoGlam is trying to do is sort of learn from each of them and provide guidance and best practices, both for the people producing the data system uh, services and those for, pe for, for people looking for a service that might fulfill their needs. It's, we're sort of trying to serve that curation role. Um, and we've also all identi identified that um, lack, or access, lack of access to, to field data, to uh, validation data, is um, a concern in, other, uh, in, in, in a number of applications. And so we're starting to discuss what might be done about this. Um, I don't think it's necessarily within GeoGlam's purview, but there are other activities. For example, there's another G20 initiative called GoDan which is the Global Open Data uh, for Agriculture and Nutrition activity, and that might be something that they take on, they're evaluating their next five years now, and it would be a very meaningful calibration, uh, contribution to have sort of uh, a, a managed repository of, of available field data for, for validation.
Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, now we've done three questions from each of the Spanish and English channels, so I'll turn it back to the Spanish channel. Um, Gloria, do we have any other questions coming in um, in Spanish? Yes, we do have one question from Guatemala. We will offer them the floor. Guatemala, your microphone is open. Oh, yes, thank you, thank you. Oh, we are hearing about these initiatives about the courses that are being offered regarding the use of these tools. But we were wondering, how could we uh, arrange for a specific course for a group together with the School of Agronomy at the University of San Carlos, for example? Would it have to be through the focal point or... Uh, through, uh, through the contacts you provided us, because you also mentioned the G20 group, uh, where the uh, uh, which where the leaders so, or the leads would be the uh, uh, ministries of agriculture. How how could we go about uh, these additional courses specifically? Thank you. Um. I'm not 100% sure that I understood the question. Um, if, if the question is, um, how could you establish a relationship with um, a trainer or a or a start a sort of knowledge transfer relationship that would be specifically targeted at your institution's needs? Um, what's the the thing that should be made clear is GeoGlam. In, in my case, I'll speak from the GeoGlam perspective, we are um, a volunteer effort, so people people see value in, in participating, um, and, but they don't necessarily receive extra funds for doing so. Um, and so typically what we have to do if we want to initiate a new training relationship or plan, um, plan a workshop or plan a series of capacity development ex activities is work together to um, secure essentially funding for, for such an activity um, that might cover travel, that might cover salaries, that might cover um, if there's going to be uh, software or hardware involved in terms of transferring over a new technology, we would look for that as well. Um, but I would say it's unique to sort of every situation, what the needs are and what the um, what the budget available is, and um, you can you can contact me if you'd like. We, like like I said, within GeoGlam, we serve as a sort of a curation role, and um, by bringing that to, for example, the working group in the Americas, you might we might find an opportunity for a partnership with another country or another institution who's really interested in um, working together on such an initiative. Uh, and I'll, I'll just uh, add, Alyssa, if you don't mind, um, you know, uh, we, we hear a lot of interest in developing uh, these, training, uh, these training materials and training opportunities. Um, I'll, I'll speak uh, from the Canadian perspective. Uh, we are currently in the process of developing a training um, session on uh, specifically on how you would use radar satellites in, in agriculture. Um, so that's going to be a probably four or five day uh, course. Um, we'll probably start with delivering it here in Ottawa, um, but it will be specifically uh, related to agriculture and the use of this technology in agriculture, um, both on the theory side, um, more in depth than what I talked about today, but also on the hands-on and using some of that open source data. Um, but we do hear a lot of interest in uh, capacity building, and um, it would be great to maybe working with AIC as well. We could uh, see whether there's some opportunities to to deliver this. There's various mechanisms to do it. We've done it through webinars, um, you know, traveling courses or hosting courses in a particular site. Um, so there's various ways that that maybe we could do that. So maybe that's something AIC can can help us with. 
We also, um, on the training side, um, I spent three months in Chile uh, working with them. Um, and I've also hosted people as well in our institution. Um, and there are sometimes funding opportunities to bring interns into our um, institutions to, to get more in-depth training as well. So I think we have to look at a broad range of tools and delivery. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, it seems that we have reached uh, the end of our time for this webinar. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who participated, um, in particular our very knowledgeable speakers, um, as well as everyone who is listening. And um, please feel free to contact either one of the speakers or to contact our ECA office here in Canada if you have any follow-up questions or um, ideas for um, different ways to collaborate, as well as if you're interested in some of this training, um, we'll definitely keep this discussion going. So thank you very much to everyone, and have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias.